Welcome to week five of the Adam Doro Show presented by Lawrence Hall from the ACU TV studios on the campus of Abilene Christian University. I'm Grant Boone alongside Owen Simpson and the head football coach at ACU, Adam Doro. Having lost their first six meetings with McNeese, the Wildcats are in seventh heaven after an unforgettable victory last Saturday night over the perennial powerhouse of the Southland Conference. Coach, you told me on the radio pregame show that you wanted your team to know the history between these two programs, that this would be the first ACU victory in the series. You didn't shy away from the truth, and then you go and you get the job done. I know in the standings it's going to count as just one win, but what potentially could a, a win like last Saturday do for your program? Well, I think, I think it does a lot for your, uh, your confidence as a football program. Anytime you haven't done anything uh, and you do it for the first time, you know, we talk about a lot about legacy in our program and to see our guys really – uh, not shy away. They weren't scared to play McNeese. They were really embracing that. And we know if we want to do the things we want to do as a football program, if you want to get to where you want to get, you got to be programs like that. And, you know, I say that out of respect to McNeese. They've been totally. an elite program uh, in the FCS. They have a ton of tradition. Uh, they have great, great athletes uh, for the FCS level. They've always had really good coaches and uh, just you know, just a really good resume to back it up. And so, you know, you look right now, setting one and one in the conference where you could have uh, maybe been 0 and 2 mm. or 2 and 0. Uh, I just think that's going to be the theme each and every week in the Southland Conference right now. And as a coach and a former player, coming off a big win, what are the challenges to prepare for the next week? Well, I, I think they're. The, Depending on, on the stages of your program, there can be a challenge uh, where we're at right now, and I feel like our maturity uh, in, in our football team, uh, like I told you, we've had a really, really good week of practice, and I think our guys are super focused. Uh, we're going to play the defending conference champion, mm -hmm. co-conference champion on the road at their place. They got our attention immediately when you turn on the film. Uh, been a little bit challenging this week because they've only played three games. Yeah. Uh, the body of work that we have to build off of their films is not a ton. And, and quite candidly, the teams that they've played, uh, we don't have a lot of co in common with those. So that's a, that's a good and a bad thing. We're, we've got to prepare for things we haven't seen, but same thing for Incarnate Word. They have to pre prepare for things that they haven't seen all year from us. The good news is you do have, with a lot of your players, something to draw from. Last year you got on a roll and yep. you won four straight games. So those players who were here last year know what it's like to get on a streak. We're going to preview that game tonight against Incarnate Word in a bit. But when we return, highlights in Coach Doral's analysis from last week's exciting victory against McNeese. Stay with us. This is the Adam Doral Show. Welcome back to the Adam Doral Show. Sometimes when you're trying to do something you've never done before, you might need a little divine intervention. Well, last Saturday night at Wildcat Stadium, Ace, you defeated McNeese for the first time in seven meetings, 17 to 10 the final score, by making a lot of their own breaks and maybe, maybe receiving an immaculate bounce here and there. We'll talk about that in a moment. But first, Coach, uh, it's worth noting McNeese, as you said in our opening segment, they are the, the preeminent program in this conference. Yeah. Other Teams have had nice runs, but for 40 some odd yeah. years, they've won twice as many conference championships as anyone yeah. else. 14. They've had 14 straight winning seasons on this level uh, it is remarkable. How much going in and then as you watch the game unfold, how much do they resemble some of those teams that we've seen in years past? Yeah, they do. I, I think uh, right now everything they do really starts defensively. <laughs> And they've just got unbelievable athletes, especially on the corner position uh, in the secondary. And then they always are notorious for having great defensive linemen. And, and not only are they athletic group of defensive linemen, they play the run well. Uh, they try to get you in third and long situations so they can pin their ears back and go. And, you know, they're just super talented on the defensive side of the football. And then offensively, they always have really good running backs, skill players, good quarterback, good old. I mean, they're just a complete team from top to bottom. They're always really good on special teams, as <laughs> unfortunately we found out uh, the last two years. And yeah. so uh, it was just a huge win for us in, in the fashion that we did it in. Yeah. Now, early on, it was pretty obvious it was going to be a defensive battle. Yeah. So what were your reactions after the first quarter? Well, there was, I thought our defense was playing really good. We, our defense was playing how we wanted them to. Uh, I think second quarter, they really got settled in. We started stopping the run better. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to make some adjustments. They were using a, a pin and fold scheme we hadn't seen on film. And so, you know, Coach Brown, our defensive staff, got our guys at the sideline, made adjustments in a relatively short amount of time. And then uh, I think we were just being really smart on deep, uh, offense. We weren't turning the fo football over. We were plus three. I mean, if you're plus three in the South and Conference on turnover margin, you're going to have a chance each and every week. And so that was the thing I just kept reiterating to our guys. Hey, things aren't going how we want them to go on offense. But if you remember going into that game, McNeese had, had uh, forced eight fumbles. Mm -hmm. And so 
to not fumble uh, a ball the entire night, I think, was really, really cool on our guys. I thought Luke did a really good job of not forcing throws the entire night. And then, you know, you go back and you watch the film, and there's just things we feel like we got to do better. We should have executed better. Uh, I don't feel like we played as well as we have been playing on the O-line and to tie it in in the fullback spot. But it's no secret for us, if, if we want to do the things we want to do offensively, we got to be able to run the football. Especially in a game like that, nothing wrong with a punt. Uh, you know, don't turn the ball over, punt it, make them go the distance, uh, and a punt would figure into this game. We'll talk about that uh, in a bit. Midway through the second quarter, they pin you back on your 10-yard line. You've got a third and, I think, seven. Josh makes a sliding catch, yeah. first down. Now you get a new set of downs. You get uh, a third down play a little later in the drive on your own 41-yard line. They send half of Lake Charles yeah. at you, it looks like. Luke finds Tracy James alone on the left sideline. Tracy takes it 59 yards for a touchdown. Help us understand the way that play unfolds. Who's making the call? How are the adjustments may take us through that yeah. play? So uh, that, that's one of our base pass plays. It's just called 685 vert rub. And uh, having a veteran quarterback like yeah. Luke, he understands part of the concept is zone. If it's zone, he's going here. If it's man, he's going here. And all week, we had seen them uh, struggle to cover the back out of the backfield into the boundary. And so Luke saw it. He had used the hard cadence to probe them. Uh, they showed they were coming blitz, and Tracy ran a route, didn't get hung up, and hit him. And so it literally it worked exactly how it's drawn up. But to be able to see him finish the play and get mm. down and get a touchdown, I thought was huge. Really good job by Luke and not panicking and hanging in there, knowing he was probably going to get hit pretty good. So uh, just a, it was a great football play. Yeah. Now, McNeese had a lot of success running the football in the first quarter. We saw a lot of that. Second quarter, things really took a complete turn. Only 11 rushing yards allowed on McNeese for, for offense in the second quarter. What was the change made between those two quarters that we saw on the field? Yeah, they were using a, a pin and pull system that literally we had not seen in the first couple of weeks. And so our, our guys, that w Coach Brown adjusted the shades that we were playing against them. Uh, whether you're playing an inside shade on the guard or a head up to outside, and we started playing more head up on them to confuse their pin and pull scheme, and it, it really worked because they, they stopped doing it. And then we felt like, you know, going into the game that our four against their five, we felt like we were going to have success against those guys. We really did. And so after they stopped utilizing that scheme and went back to their stuff, their base schemes, our guys were really great at uh, being gap sound, gap oriented. And I thought uh, for a, a team like McNeese with the athletes they had, I thought we did a really good job of tackling an open field. A lot changed in the fourth quarter. There's a lot of momentum shifts. Yeah. You're forced to a three and out after they tie the ball game, and then you have to go and punt it. Yeah. Really, momentum completely shifted in 45 seconds in matter of that game. Uh, walk us through that offensive uh, drive where you're forced to a three and out, and ultimately the outcome of that. Punt. Yeah, it, th those are really, really tough situations as a head coach because there's enough time to go down and score, and you have timeouts, but the momentum is totally swung on you. And if you go three and out and you punt the football and you let them have all their timeouts, mm. it's a bad deal. And so we were trying to, we tried to be very aggressive on first down, didn't work. The second down play, uh, we ran a, uh, our best run play with knowing that, hey, we're, we're going to get really positive yards, try to get it to a short third down. Unfortunately, the ball bounced and Tracy ran out of bounds, so it stopped the clock. Yeah. And so just killed us because at that point in time, you were going to force them to use a timeout. Then we didn't get the third down mm -hmm. conversion, and then that's when things really changed. We had done a great job punting the ball the whole night. Uh, the last two punts we'd shanked. And can we go ahead and talk about that? M might as well. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, because it was great. It was. The first three, three and a half quarters, yeah. the punting was really was a weapon. And you've got a guy, Kyron Sutton, who can, can, can beat yeah, you yeah. like he beat us last year. But those, those two punts gave them opportunities. Yeah, they, they did and gave them a short porch, and it really – uh, really hurt our defense, unfortunately. And so last punt, I was really proud of our coaches. We got Simon on the headphones and just said, you know, what do you want to do? And he just said, I want to punt it to the field. And that had not been our game plan. Because when you punt to the field, you're giving him a lot of room. And mm -hmm. we got the punt team together. And Coach J.B. Brown, you know, told, told literally told Simon to, to punt it to the field, but uh, to kick it as kick it high enough so so Jesus can touch it, <laughs> and uh, boy, he boomed it, didn't he? And it it hung up, it hung up. It's almost five seconds. It think. was, and Greg Green, God bless him, was covering and covering and covering, and Greg has the wherewithal to see that he's going to beat um, the ball there, so I can't hit the returner, mm. but he there's a guy blocking him, and Greg. Shoves him into yeah, the yeah, returner, which yeah. is perfectly legal. Yeah. It's college football. Yeah. And 
the guy fumbled the football, and, and David Stone, man, just proud of David and, and just his hustle and hustle and hustle and being able to jump with that football. David Stone, you beat Goliath. It sounds biblical yeah. to me. <laughs> and the punt, Jesus touched the punt. Um, so so here's, what's, here's what's crazy, though, about that incredible double momentum yeah. shift. They get the momentum tying the game forcing a punt, then we get the momentum back. You're still on the 40 of McNeese, it's not, and you're going into the wind. It's right. not like you've got an easy field goal here. And you got a third and 14, yep. and Javorian Miller, who had a ball go through his yeah. hands on that three and out, yeah. makes, I think, the biggest catch of, of you know, certainly of his young sure. ACU career. Sure. And then a play that I think we'll be talking about for a long time. Luke, uh, they drop a guy. You know, and uh, he, Luke doesn't see him, hits his hands, the ball's in the air, and Tracy runs under it. It is shades of the immaculate reception, Pittsburgh Steelers. As a lifelong Raider fan, I had a tra <laughs> traumatic flashback to 1972. Uh, but, but Tracy said something interesting to M.K. Rotenberry on the postgame radio show. He said, she was saying, take us through that play. He said, um, we've been taught and, and we know when you are where you are supposed to be, good things can happen. And I thought that sounds yeah. like life advice, yeah, but, yeah. but um, it, and it reminded me of what the great golfer Gary Player said, the harder I work, yep. the luckier I yep. get. Absolutely. No, that's, there's everything you just said, I believe in wholeheartedly, man. I think, I think luck favors uh, the people that are good people, that are hardworking people, that are uh, kind Christian people. I really, really believe that. And, and, and that's in any endeavor in life, whether it's sports, business world. And Tracy just really epitomizes that, everything that he's been through. Um, you know, Luke, we go through again, we run one of our best pass plays. Luke, the read is right. He's going to run the, hit the shallow dragger. Uh, we're just trying to cut the field goal distance down, you know, and, and the backside DN dropped and hit the ball. And so to see Tracy just uh, have the foresight to catch it, I, I honestly thought he was going to score too, yeah. when he took off. And um, they bailed us out at that timeout, to be honest with you, at mm. the end. That was, they were, gave us the ability to regroup put our big people in the game yeah. and we said well there's no question we are going to run the ball here because mm -hmm. we had plenty of time if we didn't get it to uh KC yeah. it kill the clock and yep. then we'd kick a field goal yep. so but no doubt we were pulling our best puller Cade Parmley <laughs> and, and uh running our best run play so um, it was great to see those guys get it done right AC is now one and one in conference play road game tonight against Incarnate Word in San Antonio we're going to preview that game in a bit but first as we go to break take a look at scores from last week in the Southland Conference this is the Adam Doral show presented by Lawrence Hall Welcome back to the show. I'm Tavian Miles. The ACU soccer team is off to an impressive start in the 2019 season. The Wildcats took on nationally ranked Baylor Lady Bears September 15th at Elmer Gray Stadium for homecoming. Baylor fell into a 1-0 hole at halftime after a goal from ACU's Shea Johnson in the 25th minute. Later in the second half, the Lady Bears tied things up in the 56th minute and things got heated after that. In minute 84, ACU's Megan Paul and Baylor's Reagan Paget were given red cards after getting into an altercation. The game ultimately ended in a double overtime draw as neither team were able to capitalize in extra time. It was the first time the Wildcats hadn't lost to a Power 5 conference in Division I history. Last Friday, the soccer team opened up conference play at home against Houston Baptist. The Wildcats struggled early but later found success in the first half finding the net on three occasions. After leading 3-0 at halftime, ACU scored another goal while HBU scored in the 58th minute. ACU soccer will be back in action Friday as they travel east into Louisiana to play Nichols. Wildcat Volleyball hosted its first tournament as a member of Division I earlier in September. ACU struggled but remained competitive going 1-2 in Moody Coliseum. They lost to North Texas and Fullerton in straight sets but took down Prairie View A&M in five sets. The Wildcats sit at 2-8 on the season and begin conference play Thursday at Moody when they take on the University of Incarnate Word. Coming up, Tracy James has been leading the Wildcats this season with his performance. He leads the FCS in rushing touchdowns and looks to continue that success this week and into the rest of the season. Owen Simpson sat down with James to talk about his season so far and how football has played a role in his life well before college. All right, Tracy, before we talk about this year, let's talk about before ACU. Now, when did your, when did your passion for football really start and how much of an impact did it have growing up? My passion with football started when I first moved to Texas. You know, I lived in Minnesota at first, so all we did was play basketball up there. And football, it was during winter, and winter up there is not good. So once I moved down here, 
I decided to play football once the coach came up to my elementary school and was talking to us, all the boys. So I told my mom I wanted to try out, and then ever since then, it's been history with it. And everyone faces some type of adversity growing up. What were some challenges for you growing up and now even into college? I've been through a lot at a young age. Most people have. So when my mom divorced me as a single mother, there's a lot of ups and downs that come with that. So uh, there was a bunch of things like, you know, homeless shelters, things like that. So just going through that, it taught me a lot of a lot of things with that, so I translated that to the football field, so I knew that adversity always comes, so never just get too down over things. And you built yourself quite a resume your junior and senior year at Woodrow Wilson. Over 3,400 rushing yards and 40 plus touchdowns, and you're fast now. You were pretty fast back then to a 4.640 yard dash time. With that kind of resume, you could go to a lot of places. Why choose ACU? Just everything just worked out just to fall at ACU. There was a lot of things that went in with that, a bunch of other schools, but it just didn't work out with that at some point. So everything led up to going to ACU. And when I had a choice, uh, just the culture, when I met the, even though it was a diff different coaching staff at that point, the team, the players, all that, they had a different vibe to them that me and my mom liked. So when I had to choose at the end of the day, uh, what school I wanted to go to was ACU. And you ended up committing to ACU. You redshirted 2015. Different coach back then. You played back at Shotwell Stadium, now in a new stadium here on campus. In your time, now this is in essence your fifth year on the team, what have been some of your most cherished moments? The most cherished moments have just been every second just at ACU, you know. I've been through a lot through ACU, you know, different coaching staffs, different head coaches. It was a lot to learn through both. So. Every minute, every second that I've been here, I've always cherished everything, so there's nothing else. And now, fast forward, we're in 2019. I mean, you've had some great numbers so far, Tracy. Seven rushing touchdowns, that's tied for third in the FCS. 4.7 yards rushing per carry. Uh, what should we expect from you throughout the rest of the season? How impressed have you been with your numbers so far? I mean, it's the start of the year, so we never know the ending yet. So. All I'm going to do is just keep working how I've been working, working hard, trying to be the hardest worker on the field, everything like that. So we're just going to take it day by day and just see what happens in the end. Hopefully we win that, that ring in the end. 99% of the time, kids always dream about going to play in the NFL. Now, again, majority of the time, that dream stays a dream. But for you, that's still a very high possibility. What would it mean for you to get that call one day and say, you're a member of the National Football League, and what do you think needs to happen for that to be accomplished? If I get that call to go to the NFL, it would be something great, you know. It would show that people from small schools like Abilene Christian, like we have talent that can do that. We showed that with Charkandrick West or Taylor Gabriel. So I want to be the next, next person like them, you know, be up there with Daniel Manning, people like that. So I just want to show people on my team right now that, Later on, they can still do that, even though we're at a small school. But we can still compete with people in the NFL, hopefully. All right, Tracy. Well, thanks for joining me. Thank you. As we welcome you back to the Adam Doral Show, take a look at the Southland Conference standings now that every team has played at least one league game. You'll see five teams 1-0, and five teams 0-1, oh and, and there's ACU right in the middle at 1-1 one and one after the huge win over McNeese last week. Now take a peek at today's conference schedule. Ten of the 11 teams are in action, including eight squaring off against a league rival. Big game in Lake Charles. McNeese hosts Sam Houston State. Cowboys trying to avoid an 0-2 oh start against the Bearcats, who silenced Incarnate Word last Saturday. Tonight in San Antonio, ACU gets its shot against UIW, the first of two straight road games against teams that rose from the bottom of the conference standings in recent years to make the playoffs a season ago. The Wildcats will take on the other Cardinals, the ones from Lamar next Saturday night in Beaumont. As for UIW coach coming off a dream season last year that saw them earn a share of the conference title, they led the league in both points and, and, and total offense. 
They did say goodbye to the league's leading rusher, Raquan Dickens, but they returned a lot of starters, including quarterback John Copeland. What impressed you most about the job that Eric Morris did in his first year as head coach at Incarnate Word last I think, year? I think just the culture. I think he went in there and, and uh, was really good about turning the culture. I think, uh, and, and I've told him that, you know, when you are dealing with a bunch of guys that had been there for three years that – had maybe won what three or four games yeah. maybe uh, to get a group of guys inspire them to believe to believe in themselves it's one of the uh, hardest things about coaching mm. so I thought I really thought that their story last year was one of the most underrated stories in college football Agreed. I mean I it was unbelievable yeah. what those guys did and so a lot of those kids are back uh, you know the the, the uh, O-line uh, quarterbacks back I think he was freshman of the year obviously the running backs gone but Receivers are back. A lot of the defensive lines back. I think their defensive line played really, really good last year, and uh, you know, so far this year they've played really well, uh, really good as well. Yeah. And coach, there's a lot of positives to take away from last week's game, and then going up against Incarnate Word, who, who's been inconsistent at best on offense, especially after your solid performance on defense last week. Uh, Incarnate Word scored seven points week one. They exploded for 60 plus points in week two, and then they were held to just six points against Sam Houston last week. What is going to be your key priority to contain on the defensive side? Well, I, I think when you play an offense like that, I think if you're giving up the deep vertical footballs over the top, I think that plays right into their hand. And so uh, you've got to keep everything inside and in front. You've got to disguise your coverages. So much of what they do, uh, in my opinion, is pre-snap coverage. Is, it, is the middle of the field open or closed? And so are you playing man or zone? And so we've got to do a really good job of disguising those coverages. And then bottom line, when you're playing a team like that that likes to throw the football, uh, try to make them one-dimensional. Don't give up running yards. And then, but if you can get pass rush with four guys, it's it's really really big deal. You don't want to have to blitz teams like that. You really open yourself up in the back end when you start doing that. They're all they were also terrific last year taking the ball away. Yeah. They were tied for fourth in the nation with 30 takeaways, and and that'll always be um, a, a a big part of of what you preach to your team. As we wrap up here, uh, a lot of folks. They, they love Quayshon Washington. He yeah. played football at Abilene High, and he's, and he's been a terrific player for you. What can you tell us about Quayshon? We saw him on the ground late in the game. Yeah, he's, uh, he's doing okay, and uh, he, he's going to be done for the year, unfortunately. Mm. But the uh, positive thing is uh, he can medical redshirt, and we didn't redshirt him his first year. So uh, like I told him in the training room after the game, I said there's no excuse. You will have an undergrad degree and a master's degree <laughs> uh, by the time you leave Abilene Christian University. And he's uh, – it's what you expect from a guy like him. He's in great spirits. Uh, we'll, we'll get him taken care of, and he'll turn into a, a really valuable student coach for us here uh, in the last part of the season. That's a great way to look at it. All right, it's Ace Union Incarnate Word tonight in San Antonio. Always have a great crowd there uh, at Benson Stadium, so hopefully we can uh, be a little louder than, than the home team's crowd will be. Kickoff is set for 6 p.m. Jim Reese and I will have the pregame show on radio beginning at 530. You can listen on 98.1 FM here in Abilene and online. Get the link at acusports.com or you can listen via the iHeartRadio app. For Coach Doral and for Owen, I'm Grant Boone. Thanks for watching the Adam Doral Show presented by Lawrence Hall. Enjoy the game tonight. We'll see you right here next week.